It's a great honor to speak to you today. So I will apologize for my accent. I'm half French, half Japanese, and I speak with a mixture of all the words of the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the accent combined. Uh, so like the introduction said, I just, uh, I just flew from Tokyo because I was doing research in Fukushima. And I arrived in London before yesterday, and I arrived this morning at 1 AM. So I'm also very jet lagged, so it's not going to help. So uh, I'm going to present to you today Prote, which is an autonomous sailing robot that collects oil spills. But before I do so, I will tell you the history and, and how it came to, to be. So the story started when I was a construction manager in Kenya for a mobile technology uh, incubator. And uh, so in the morning, I was a um, construction manager. And in the afternoon, I was uh, developing an environmental sensing uh, database or software, how, how you want to call it. And so while I was working in Kenya, the oil spill happened in the Gulf of Mexico. And that was very far, and I felt very powerless. I couldn't do anything. And um, it happened that the software for which I was building the headquarters is called Ushahidi. And Ushahidi was de deployed to map out the oil spill. So you guys know about the oil spill because you've been also affected, maybe you're not on that side of Florida. But the other side of Florida has been, has been affected. And each of the red points that you see are reports by civilians. So people like you and I, just with a mobile phone, they could report where the oil was coming. Well, if, if, if they smell something or if they have a headache, it could be reported. So these are the kind of data that the governments cannot, you know, usually don't, don't take so much in, into, into concern, but that represent a real impact of the oil spill. And so I was really lucky because uh, from working in Kenya, because of the software that was used and because of my uh, background in making objects, I was called by MIT to help build devices to clean up the oil spill. And so I thought, wow, actually, I could really do something. I felt like it's not about only sensing, but I could also be in involved into cleaning. And when I arrived in MIT, it was very much like paradise. So <laughs> uh, it's like a, a place full of toys, and you have all these kids, they're excited, and you're having all these uh, sparks of uh, creativity. And so it was amazing. But at the same time, uh, when you're in a context where you have lots of money, you're making a technology that's very expensive. When you're given time, you're taking time to make technology happen. And because of the context of academy, are oftentimes the technology you're developing is patented. So even though it's paid by the taxpayers, what you're going to develop eventually, you're going to sell it back to the people who already paid for it. And <laughs> it didn't feel quite right. And also it felt like I was in paradise, but I was addressing hell. And so I, I felt like very disconnected from the subject. So I, as, as soon as I could have a chance, I took a plane to uh, New Orleans and rented a boat. And you can only see the hand of the captain. That, uh, so that's a friend. The hairy guy is a friend of mine. But, uh, but the, uh, the, the guy next to him is the captain, and uh, you don't have a picture of him because uh, he doesn't necessarily want to because he doesn't have legs anymore. So when I arrived in the harbor, the guy came in the wheelchair, and I was like, what? And that was the captain, and I had to help him get in the boat, and I asked him, where are your legs? And, uh, <laughs> and, and <laughs> it's not funny. Uh, and, so, and so he explained to me that he's lost his first leg in the Hurricane Katrina and then the second leg trying to regain you know, his fleet and his men. And uh, the only thing that's left for him to do is to clean up the oil spill eventually. So he's lost his, his boat and now he cannot fish anymore because of the oil and now he can only clean. And so I told him candidly, hey, I'm Caesar from uh, Boston and uh, we're developing robots that are going to replace you. And, um, and I think I was really lucky that he didn't, ha didn't have legs because he probably would have beaten me up, probably. <laughs> but uh, only by the, the anger in his eyes and the frustration, I could tell that I, I, it made me understood I was doing something deeply wrong, basically. And so um, I decided to, to study what was happening to them. So the, the cleaners actually doing, doing the, the work of cleaning, they clean only a few percent of the oil and they expose their house to very high toxic and their life expectancy is very, very much lower than normal fishermen, which are already the highest death rates uh, for, for working. And so I decided to go back to Boston, I make my report and I resigned uh, from my dream job and I decided to develop a technology that would be developed not on the long term, but short term, that would be developed possibly faster and that would be open source and trying to include the fishermen into the process of de 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 developing that technology. So I moved to the Gulf of Mexico. I didn't have any more money, so I uh, couch surf. 
and uh, enroll into a, a, a non-profit organization called the Louisiana Bokeh Brigade. And so we could, at, maybe you, you, you remember that time, but we were not allowed anymore to approach the oil, the oil spill at some point. We could not approach the booms or the oil or we'd become a class D felon at the time and $40,000 of, of a fine. So we were not allowed to access our, our means of, of uh, researching. And so what we did in this nonprofit was very simple. We took a soda bottle, two liters, and we put a camera inside it. We attach the, the, the bottle uh, under a helium balloon and we fly it at the end of a line. And we take thousands of pictures and we take, so we, we fly those balloons and we stitch those pictures into making high resolution maps. They're 100 times more precise than satellite imagery and the on demand and one rig cost about $200. So on demand, the residents can make, uh, uh, so they, they could, thanks very much. They could basically monitor their own environment and you know, for example, they could file claims and they could say the oil is coming here and we need support and stuff. And so that tells me that we can develop humble technology that is relevant and you know, has efficiency. So during this research, I, I, I was every day looking at the reports uh, of the NOAA and looking where the oil is moving. And what you see is actually the oil is moving, it's not a big blob. So this is what you see from a satellite. But if you get closer, you see that these are long stretches and they're moving with the wind, surface currents, and the waves. And what's happening right now is that we have an OSP happening and you send many boats. And in fact, they collect a very small portion of, of the oil spill. It's just like cleaning, making clean paths in an ocean of, of oil. If you take the same length of boom, just the white is the absorbent and the orange is the, the food was really good. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, if you go up the wind, you can collect a lot more. But you collect even more if you multiply the rig. The problem is how do you move such a big object with little force against the enormous forces of the ocean? Well, this is what sailing boats are doing. So we thought, what if we just sail upwind? So we're basically tacking up the wind. And so that's the premises of the technology we, we, we came up with, it's called Protei. And so the idea is this. So we, we just took a normal boat, trying to sail it uh, in the river and go in zigzag. But what we could see is that we're losing two things. The first uh, is that we're losing the capacity of pulling, of course, because it's long and heavy. And the second, we're losing direction. So we, it's difficult to direct. Why? I need to give you a bit of background of uh, maritime architecture. So you, you have a sail, and you determine the center of gravity or center of push. Right beneath it, this is where you put the center board that would balance the forces. And uh, then you put uh, the, the rudder at the back, which acts as a lever, if you will, and this has a center of rotation. The issue is that it's easy to rotate the lever when you have nothing behind it. But if you add something long and heavy at the back, it becomes really difficult to steer. So the basic idea that we had is to take the rudder and put it at the front, so we could have maybe we thought maybe we'd have more maybe we have more control. So with this small RC boat, so I just hack a small RC boat, and with the 14 centimeter rudder, we can control a four meters long tail, which means that with a very small force, you can control a very big object. So that's in Lake Pontchartrain, and that's a 300 you know dollar just a hacked uh, kit. So. You see the rudder is at the front, so for those who like sailing, you'll see that with, with this, you actually have a better control, just like in a car. When you're in a car, your, your direction will at the front. So you're turning, and you, you know, you're, you're turning. But with a boat, normally you're turning at the back, so it's just like if you had a car and you know the back is turning, it doesn't feel right. And so I, I kept thinking about the same thing. So uh, you know, better cars like the, the four-wheel drive have even better control. So what if we don't have only a rudder at the front? but also another one at the back, or more points of control. What if the entire thing became the, 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 the control? So we designed this boat, which is entirely curving, basically. So the whole boat changes shape, and the advantage of this is that you have a much better control, so the, so the boat curves, and so what happens is it kind of surfs inside the wave because you're using the centrifugal force, you di you're displacing the center of gravity, uh, to the center of, uh, of flotation, so you, you become more agile, you can re re reduce the radius of rotation, etc., etc. And uh, one most important thing is that, so that's an accidental finding. We, we're just trying to tow something long and heavy. But when you're turning, uh, this time it's, it's jabbing, but because the angle of the body and the angle of the front are two different angles to the wind, what happens is that you can catch wind from both sides, or you can catch the wind faster so the wind's coming from that side, and you, and you basically propel. The, 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 some part of the wind goes in this way, and some goes this way. It means that you all always have pull, constant pull. 
means that with a small object, you can have a constant pulling power. So that was very cool, and we're like, wow, that's, that's really exciting. And, um, but then we needed to go further. Like, this is really cool, but it might be very expensive, so it doesn't make any sense. So how could we implement that system for really cheap and deploy many of these units? So we built the same for 100, under $100, so it's just inflatable, it's just a very cheap uh, you know, tarp or like plastic you can find in the ACE hardware, and um, sand, sandbags at the bottom, just to see mechanically how it would react. So instead of uh, putting motors, I would be dragged behind the boat. So it's very, very lightweight, and you have a very big sail. So the footprint in the, of the, the boat, if you go underwater, you will see it's very light. It's basically like a, like a um, Zeppelin balloon. So it's like an ocean zeppelin. So it has a great pulling power and it's very light. So basically, uh, there's lots of accidental findings in this, and these are the physical questions we're asking. Can we have a better control with the, with the shape-shifting hull? The second is, can we tack upwind and have constant pull? And the third, which is probably the most promising and which we have no evidence yet, is an airplane wing is a curve like this. So when you're moving in this direction, you're creating a vertical lift, right? So you, your plane wing is going this way, and you're flying this way. Now, this boat is doing the same thing, but you're putting the wing horizontal. So you're creating lateral lift. So say, if the wind is coming from this direction, then it will increase how much I drift. But if the wind was coming from your direction, and my wing was in this direction, I could go closer to the wind. So I create more relative winds. So today, the fastest boat on Earth is called the Hydroptere. It's going 50, more than 50 knots, so it's more than 100 kilometers. It's very, very fast. And if you basically have hydrofoils turned sideways, we can probably improve uh, performance, etc. So it has application for uh, pulling a strong power, but also super fast sailing. The other advantage is that you, you, you don't have um, one piece and one piece at the back. So if you're hitting a rock, it doesn't matter. It's all soft, and it's all a one continuous shape. So there's much less turbulences created because you don't have one place where you have turbulences that create you know, drag at the back. So mechanically, there's lots of advantages. So once we are sure that uh, this technology had some interesting promises, we decided to make the project open source. So uh, we fundraised on the Kickstarter, and in six weeks, we collected $30,000, thanks to 300 people, and we recruited a team of uh, engineers and designers and prototype makers so what is open hardware? Open hardware is that everybody can use, modify, and distribute for free. That means that the design, you'll, you can go on the website and, and download all the, the, the cards and the eagle file and all the programming files. And in exchange, the only thing we ask is that people share the, their findings and the credit uh, uh, protein. So we know like attribution, basically. So maybe we're not making lots of money in the short term, but we hope that we have a maximum Im environmental impact and on the long term, it's better because we also become the nexus of this technology development and we make sure that it's distributed. And uh, the, the enormous advantage is that um, in normal uh, technology development, you have a scientist selling an idea to an industrial and you know, then it's being, it's being sold and etc. But when you're doing open source, everybody has an interest of developing the technology as fast as possible. So it's as much as not an artistic experiment as it's a design or science or, in a, in a, or a manufacturing experiment. So we built another bigger one, so that's uh, in uh, Rotterdam this summer. Uh, it's three meter one uh, by six meter high. So this one has the other advantages as well. It's curving vertically as well. So it's not only going like this, but it's also going like this, which means that when there's an impact of waves, the, the wave doesn't, you know, it's not like traditional boats, like trying to cut the water. This one is basically curving on the water. So again, you, you don't lose energy by trying to be strong. It's, it's really the other approach of uh, engineering, trying to be soft and understanding the elements in which you're, 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 you're working. So it didn't go as well <laughs> as we thought it, it would go, exactly. But we had some uh, interesting tests for, for this prototype. So basically what we're doing is to, we're doing like a, a, f a fast forward evolution of sailing science, if you, if, if you will. And uh, the, the, com the computational architecture, or the, the, the electronic architecture is also complexifying right now. This is what we haven't done yet, but this is what we're dreaming about, is to have a centralized system, decentralized system, and multi-agent, you know, a system that you can divide. And our dream is to have multiple prote operating for di the different tasks. So I'm going to talk about the application. Yes, so this is uh, three weeks ago disaster. in New Zealand. So oil spills are happening all the time everywhere. 
So we're not short of disaster um, to, to, to work on. So this was just uh, three weeks ago, and so yeah, there's work on the Ospia. But I want to talk about this because I just edited this uh, between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. when I came here. So I just come back from Japan. So my family lives right across the, the nuclear power plant. And so I took a bicycle from Tokyo to Sendai, so it's a few hundred kilometers I've been cycling this week. And you see this is a tsunami barrier. It's been completely destroyed. It's a 15 meter high, multi hundreds of ton structure, completely destroyed by the tsunami. The tsunami broke into the city. These are, this is the city, basically. The city gets broken and rolled. So only thing that remains of the city is the metallic structure, which are rolled into the waves, and then they're washed back into the oceans. You have tens of kilometers of uh, phantom houses, and uh, oh, the roads are broken. And, um, and so that's the part that remains the most. But most of the, the city, which, which, which were coastal, is a desert. There's nothing remaining. So, but this is not the worst thing. So. Um, so I was uh, cycling with a Geiger counter, and each point that you're seeing is basically every half an hour, I was stopping and measuring the radioactivity levels. So again, very simple technology, very cheap instruments. I borrowed the bicycle, I borrowed the Geiger counter. So we can make a, uh, almost a real-time map. It's, this is a trip of four days, and it tells you, like, the, you know, the measurements of, of, the, of uh, the radioactivity. So this is the radioactivity as we simulate it. Most of the radioacti radioactivity that we see is going towards the ocean. Yet, most of the studies that we have currently are on land. Of course, we are on land, but the food we're eating... So I was uh, staying with the, uh, in a refuge of fishermen, and they were telling me that even though the water are contaminated, uh, they, they still either eat, and if... I mean, that's, that's their life, and we need to restore the livelihood, but at the same time make sure that we e can eat or we cannot eat the fish, but we need to know. And so it's very important to do this research right now because my cousins who are uh, very small kids right now, maybe in 10 years, they have very uh, high chance of um, having a throat cancer. But if we don't measure now the radioactivity, then we cannot prove in 10 years insurance uh, that they will pay to, to pay the hospital fee. So it's very, very important to have this information. And currently, the government reports sometimes give measurements of radioactivity which are half the one that civilians do. So it's, there's a real conflict, the same as in the Gulf of Mexico, you know. Civilians are saying, the oil is here, the government says there's no oil. So it's very, very important to develop this technology really fast. So we also have millions of tons of plastic that we need to sense. I'm not going to talk, uh, the time is running, so, so that will be also very useful to measuring how much plastic there is in suspension in the ocean because we have millions of plastic which is contaminating our food chain. And also fisheries, so we have more than 80% of our stock of fish which are, are deplenished that we need to locate. Where is the fish remaining? You used to laugh at it, and now you're not laughing anymore. I'm really sorry. <laughs> okay, so the, the whole point is um, our approach uh, in Prote is trying to reverse the current model of business as usual. Currently, many times money is the main driver, and technology is what we use to make money, and the human is just a human resource, and nature is what we use an, as an added value to, you know, to sell our stuff more expensive, greenwashing. We need to flip that model and to serve nature as the main thing is the condition for human beings to, to exist. And of course, the, the human beings, we are, but we, we, are, we have to uh, protect ourselves. But technology he is here to serve us, and money is here to support the development of that technology. We are at a point in history where we have to have the courage of thinking of technology to serve nature and not uh, only human beings, because we cannot think anymore of the whole system and us at the center. So that's the only choice that is left for uh, us to, to do. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah.